with a blood gas, the ECG is an incredibly important rapid screening test. And to understand how you're going to help to diagnose, prognose and treat patients, you really need to understand the ECG's electrophysiology first. So in the heart, essentially you've got this action potential which lines up with the various parts of the ECG. Now, obviously, we need to understand which electrolytes are important. So in phase naught, the fast sodium channels open, you get the spike of depolarization, which corresponds to ventricular depolarization and the QRS complex. In phase one, potassium channels open and you get sustained plateau phase of the action potential by opening of the calcium channels. And then in phase three, you get closure of the calcium channels and opening of the potassium efflux channels. And this is the repolarization phase of the ECG corresponding to the T wave. Okay, so have a look at that diagram. Make sure we remember we've got the potassium channels, the sodium channels, the calcium channels, and how they correspond to different parts of the ECG. Right, first case. This is a 50 year old male who's had a recent pneumonia. So if we have a look at his ECG, he looks like he's in a sinus rhythm. There's P waves before every QRS complex. And although his R waves are reasonably prominent in V1 to V3, there's nothing else too scary about this ECG. However, you will see that the QT segments are looking very long. So, this is a long QT situation. So what channels are going to cause a long QT? Now remember that potassium efflux channels opening was responsible for repolarization and the T wave. So it's the blockade of this outward potassium current by drugs which prolongs the cardiac action potential. And as a result, you get QT interval prolongation. So have a look at this next diagram, which shows back to that original diagram and adds in some potassium efflux blocker toxicity. So what you get is an extending out of the repolarization period and a long QT. Now that delay in repolarization causes the myocardial cell to have less charge difference across its membrane. Now what that will do is activate the inward depolarization current known as an early after depolarization. Now that can promote triggered activity and the triggered activity can progress to polymorphic VT. And now that when it's associated with the long QT is called torsade de point. And here's the classic ECG of someone with a long QT who flicks in and thankfully out of torsades. Generally, you don't get things like torsade unless the QT absolute is greater than 500 milliseconds. It is very important to say, however, that your chance of having an arrhythmia for a given length of QT varies significantly, and it depends on the drug you've taken and the patient. So some drugs hardly ever cause arrhythmias. Some drugs are much more prone. So how do you measure the QT? Well, what you need to do is find the lead where the QT is the longest, and then you take a tangent from the steep part of the T wave downslope, and then you measure from where this point crosses the isoelectric line, and then all the way back to the start of the Q wave. You can measure it in little squares, and then multiply to get seconds, and then you need to correct for rate. And so the QT for corrected for rate is QT divided by the square root of the preceding RR interval. Now if that seems too hard, you can eyeball the QT interval by looking at the end of the T wave and seeing whether it's more than 50% of the RR interval. So a long QT, more than 500, will be more than 50% of the RR interval. So the major drugs which cause QT prolongation are the macrolide antibiotics. And in this case that we saw, this man was a schizophrenic on an antipsychotic who started erythromycin who got a long QT.
but also things like antimalarials such as chloroquine and mefloquine, obviously the antiarrhythmics, quinidine, sotalol, and even amiodarone. Now, sotalol is really the king of causing uh, VT. Antifungals and some antihistamines, the typical ones. So, how do you treat long QT from potassium efflux blockers? The most important drug by far is magnesium. Magnesium is going to help stabilize the membrane. If magnesium doesn't work for Tussard, you should really try electrical overdrive pacing. Okay, case two. This is a 27 year old person who's coming with suicidal ideation. So what we've got here is a regular broad complex rhythm. It's important to note that the QT is also long and that there's these horrible broad looking QRS complexes that don't seem to have a P wave. And then you'll also note up here that in AVR there's a significant sized R wave. We'll talk more about that later. Here's another patient with a large overdose. This ECG is the progression of the first one. So someone who is much sicker. And you'll see here that we've almost lost our defined QRS complexes and in very broad and in AVR we've got all R wave and no S wave. So does everyone know what this could be? So this is sodium channel blocking toxicity. The sodium channel blockers bind to the transmembrane sodium channels and decrease the number that are available for that rapid depolarization spike in phase naught. So, as a result, the QRS complex will widen. If you keep prolonging the QRS complex, you can end up with a sine wave and eventually even asystole, as we saw in that second ECG, which was becoming broad and ugly. The other thing is, is that you get right axis deviation of the terminal 40 milliseconds of the frontal plane QRS. And, and this is best seen by looking at the S in 1 or the R wave in AVR. I actually monitor my patients with large sodium channel block toxicity drugs on AVR, which you can just switch on your monitor. So watch how the R wave ratio changes. So we look for R wave ratios of greater than 0.7 to S wave in AVR. Looking back at our action potential, so making fewer sodium channels available during phase naught slows down the depolarization spike and extends out the QRS complex if you look at the ECG below. So here's AVR blown up. So what we're going to do is measure the ratio of the R wave to the S wave. So you measure the R wave height and you measure the S wave height. Now here obviously the ratio is greater than 1. So remember I said 0.7 was the cutoff for toxicity. The main drugs that you know about are tricyclic antidepressants local anaesthetics and obviously the type 1 antiarrhythmics like flecainide and quinine. But it's also very important to know that high dose carbamazepine, so Tegretol can do it, dextropoxyphene, which is usually combined with paracetamol into an over-the-counter analgesic drug, and propranolol, which you think would be a beta blocker in overdose, but in fact is a very dangerous sodium channel blocker. And other drugs include the old antipsychotic thyridazine, phenothiazines, amantadine and valproate and phenytoin, although it's very rare to see proper ECG effects of sodium channel blockade, even though these drugs are known to be sodium channel blockers in the brain. So the treatment of a wide QRS in someone with a sodium channel blocking toxicity is bicarbonate. And if people arrest due to this, you really need to give 100 millivolts of bicarbonate every two minutes until you get ROSC. If that doesn't work, you probably should try a lipid emulsion these days. Okay, moving on to case three. A five-year-old child comes in with some pills found in the mouth. She'd been visiting grandma's house. What do you see here? Well, this is obviously a slow, regular rhythm with broad complexes. And you'll see that there's an absence of P waves. So this is an example of a drug where two tablets can kill a child and yet if you got it it's verapamil so the calcium channel blockers what they do is they block slow voltage sensitive L-type calcium channels which are found both in cardiac tissue but also in the vascular smooth muscle 
So you get two effects. You get vasodilatation, and as you know, some calcium channel blockers are essentially mostly vasodilators, and some are more cardiac specific. And when they're cardiac specific, they are negative inotropes, they slow conduction through the SA and AV node, and they slow impulse propagation. So the main toxicity from calcium channel blockers, you usually see sinus bradycardia to start with. But you can get a reflex tachycardia initially because of the peripheral vasodilatation. As you get more and more blockade, you get various increasing AV block, and then you can get junctional and ventricular escape rhythms. And occasionally you can also see sodium channel blockade with big calcium channel overdoses. So what's the treatment for calcium channel blockers? Yep, it's calcium. And for people who have got resistant hypotension, then high dose insulin dextrose euglycemia is the treatment of choice. Most commonly, sinus bradycardia is due to beta blocker toxicity. Remember that beta-1 receptors in the heart cause negative inotropy and negative chronotropy. You also get a slowdown in the conduction velocity in the AV node and a decrease in renin. So the most common finding from a isolated beta blocker overdose is sinus bradycardia or first degree AV block. And you can get higher grade AV blocks and then junctional rhythm and conduction delay if you get more and more toxicity. Now we find that in isolated beta-1 specific receptor blockade like metoprolol that most people who've got pretty normal hearts don't get into any trouble at all. They tend to get slowed down, their blood pressure might drop a little bit, tends to be fixed by fluid, any more overdose after that tends to not make a huge amount of difference. The important thing is to remember that some beta blockers aren't and that is propranolol and sodalol because they've got lots more effects like sodium and potassium channel effects than the beta effect. So what's the treatment of a beta blocker overdose if you get bradycardia? The mainstay of treatment initially is just giving some fluids. Now if you were to have significant toxicity it is still true that glucagon can make a bit of a difference although in our experience it can be very hard to source enough glucagon to make a difference. You can use insulin dextrose euglycemia as well if you had to. Okay, case 5 is an 85 year old lady with renal failure. So if you look at her ECG, it seems to be regularly irregular. And down here what we've got is what looks like a narrow complex beat followed by a ventricular ectopic. We've also got a, another ventricular ectopic. Now that's not the same as the previous one. So we've got multifocal ventricular ectopics. And we've also got a non-isoelectric baseline with a wobble through it. So this is most likely slow AF with multiple ventricular ectopics. So this is absolutely classic for digitalis toxicity and that is sodium potassium ATPase channel blockade. So the cardiac glycosides, which is naturally curling plant-based ones and also digoxin obviously, inhibit the active transport of sodium potassium across the cell. Now this results in potassium building up on the outside and sodium building up on the inside of the cell. There is also this sodium calcium exchange pump on the cardiac membrane. And so what happens is when you increase your intracellular sodium, it reduces the transmembrane gradient and therefore the activity of the sodium and calcium exchanger. And that increases the calcium concentration inside the cell, which leads to this mild positive inotrope effect that the joxin is said to have. Now they also significantly inhibit vagal tone that may lead to a direct AV nodal depression. And remember that you get this repolarization abnormality due to the failure of that potassium and sodium exchange which causes that reverse tick style ST depression which you often see in the lateral leads because that's where they have tall R waves. You also short 
the ventricular repolarization time by blocking the ATPase, which leads to a shorter QT. So here's another example of an ECG on someone who's on therapeutic digoxin, and you'll see here's this classic reverse tick ST depression in the lateral leads. So the ECG abnormalities in cardiac glycoside toxicity are from increased automaticity because you've got that extra calcium driving extra beats, so you get new beats, but you also get slow conduction through the AV node. So you end up getting in all sorts of different dysrhythmias. So you can get excitant activity from the extra calcium, and that can be extra beats from anywhere in the heart, tachyarrhythmias and triggered arrhythmias. You can get suppressant activity, which can be sinus bradycardia, bundle branch blocks, or all the degrees of AV blocks. Or you can get a combination of excitant and suppressant activity, like we saw in the first ECG, which had multifocal ventricular ectopics and slow AF. Classically, you'll see ventricular ectopic beats the most. It's said that paroxysmal atrial tachycardia with variable block is highly suggestive of digitalis toxicity. And a marked slowing of a ventricular rate in someone who's on digoxin already suggests that they might be toxic. You classically see this in the little old lady who goes into a bit of renal failure from dehydration but keeps taking her digoxin. It's important to note that when people take oleander, and Sri Lanka is very well known for yellow oleander poisonings, that those people who don't usually have bad hearts and aren't usually in AF seem to have fewer ventricular ectopic beats in AF and much more sick sinus syndrome, so sinoatrial exit blocks and AV blocks. It's said that bidirectional ventricular tachycardia is absolutely specific for digitalis toxicity, but it is very rare. So the common glycosides, obviously digoxin, but foxglove and oleander are the most common plants and are used across the world, unfortunately, for suicide attempts. Other naturally occurring glycosides are the lily of the valley, squill, ube, and the wallflower. And in addition, the venom gland of the cane toad, which is spread through most of northern Australia, is said to have digitalis effects. So, the treatment of glycosides, which can cause any sort of arrhythmia, is, yes, digoxin antibodies. And although these are reasonably expensive, they are absolutely fantastic at saving lives. It may be true that you also need dialysis to help clear out the extra digoxin buildup and get rid of potassium if you get into trouble with hyperkalemia as well, which can be absolutely life-threatening. So in summary, the ECG on arrival in poisonings is an extremely important tool to help guide management to make a prognosis and give you extra diagnostic information which will then guide treatment. And knowing how the cardiac conduction changes manifest on the ECG by understanding the action potential is the key to accurate recognition. These references are fantastic for anyone who wants to look up in more detail. Thank you very much again for tuning in to TickMe. I look forward to seeing you next time.